When writing software, it's common to want the computer to delay for some period of time. So for example, this computer I built is running a simple program that just flashes an LED on and off a few times per second. And the software is pretty simple. It just needs to turn the LED on, wait a bit, and then turn the LED off, wait a bit, and repeat. And this, of course, is a 6502-based computer that I built. I've got a whole series of videos walking through that process and how it all works that you can check out on my channel or my website, eater.net slash 6502, where I've got uh, more info and uh, where you can get kits to build your own. Uh, but anyway, I've got this LED hooked up here to uh, bit zero of port A here, and that makes it really easy to turn on and off. Because assuming the LED is off, which we can do by writing a zero to port A, we can just increment whatever value is on port A and it'll turn that ones place bit on. And then once it's on, decrementing port A will turn it off. If we do this in a loop, then this will flash the LED uh, basically as fast as possible. But of course, it'll be too fast to see unless we put some sort of delay in here uh, between each of these instructions. And that's what this video is about. You know, how does a computer produce a precisely timed delay? So one thing we could do is use the no-op instruction, which uh, doesn't do anything, but it does take some time to execute. Problem is it doesn't take very much time, so we'd you know, need to do a, a lot of these, actually quite a lot. But if we did need just a really short delay, this might be practical. You, know, you figure the processor is running at one megahertz, and each of these no-ops is going to take two clock cycles, so that's two microseconds. So if you needed you know, a few microsecond pause, I guess uh, that would work. But for a longer pause, we could use uh, just a loop with a bunch of no-ops in it. So for example, what I'll do is I'll create a subroutine called delay where we can uh, put a delay and that way we can call it twice. So this way uh, you know, we turn our LED on and then we delay for some period of time and then we turn the LED off and then we delay for some period of time and that's our, our loop. And so the question is, what does this delay do? Like I said, we could have some no-op instructions in here, but if we want to do a whole bunch of no-op instructions, what we could do is just have a loop. We can use the X register as a counter for a loop. Uh, so we'll load the X register with FF, which is as big a value as we can put in there. It's an 8-bit register. Then we'll use the decrement X instruction, which will decrement, and then branch not equal to delay one. And so what that'll do is it'll you know start with X register as FF, and it'll decrement it, and then if it hasn't reached zero, it'll jump back up here to delay one, where it'll decrement it again. And so if we just put a no-op in here, then this will execute, in this case, 255 uh, no-op instructions. Um, and then once it's done with that, it returns from the subroutine, and that completes our, our delay subroutine. And if we want to figure out how long this delay is going to be, we could, you know, actually figure out how long each of these instructions is. So no op, we know, is two clock cycles. Decrement, I think, is also two clock cycles. And then the, the branch not equal is two or three clock cycles, depending on whether it branches or not. And so we're going to execute that 255 times. You could add all that up and figure that out. But another approach is to just run the program and see what it does. And I, I like that approach because it's, uh, it's easier. So if we get that program in here and reset the computer, it looks like the LED is just on, and I suspect what's happening is it's flashing, but it's probably just flashing too fast. So we're not delaying long enough to, to notice. And we could confirm that by looking with the oscilloscope here. If we just probe that port there, here we are in the oscilloscope, and we can see it, it, it is you know, sort of blinking on and off, if you will, but the frequency is uh, 276 hertz. So it's blinking on and off 276 times per second. So definitely too fast to see. Um, but if we slow it down by, you know, let's say a factor of 255, which, which we could do with maybe another loop, uh, then we might be able to see something. So let's give that a try. And for that, we can use the Y register, which uh, is conveniently enough available. So we'll load that with uh, FF and just create another loop around this loop, where when we get to the end of the, the, uh, the, the loop for X, we decrement Y and then branch back up to delay 2. And so that forms an outer loop. So we have an inner loop that does 255 no ops, and then an outer loop that does that 255 times. So that should uh, hopefully create a long enough delay that we'll, we'll actually be able to see something. So let's give this a try. We'll get that in there, reset. And sure enough, our LED is blinking. Okay, so that worked, but it's got a couple drawbacks. And you know, one is that in order to know exactly what the period is, or, or you know, essentially know exactly how this how long this delay is, you know, we'd have to uh, you know analyze exactly how many clock cycles each of these instructions takes and and add them up, and, and you know, depending on how many times it goes through the loop and that sort of thing. 
and, and so getting a, a, a precise delay, you know, it's certainly possible, but it's you know not exactly easy. And then of course, if the processor were running at a different speed, then that would you know change everything. Of course, the other disadvantage, of course, is that while the processor is in this loop, it can't do anything else. And you know maybe we want to flash an LED and, and actually do something else instead of use all of the processor just to flash an LED. And so the solution is usually using some sort of external hardware timer. And conveniently enough, we already have a hardware timer. This uh, 6522 versatile interface uh, adapter chip has got two timers built into it that we can use. You know, so far in my videos, I've mostly just been using these uh, I.O. ports, the, the port A and port B, which uh, let us read and write from these 16 pins here. Uh, but this chip has got some other functions. And so here are all the registers of the 6522. So we've got the output uh, and input registers, B and A, which we've been using, uh, as well as the data direction registers for B and A, which uh, uh, let us specify which bits are inputs and which are outputs on those two ports. But then we've also got you know, the timer one uh, counter low and high, and we've got a timer one latch low and high, as well as timer two counter low and high. So there are uh, actually two different timers that we can control using these registers. And the, the two timers have slightly different functions. Uh, timer one is, is a bit more capable for what we're trying to do, so that's what I'll be using. So if we go up to the top of the code here, we'll see where we've got the registers defined already. And so I'll go ahead and define uh, timer one counter low and uh, timer one counter high. And those are register numbers four and five. And of course, the way we've got the 6522 hooked up, everything is gonna show up at address 600 something, whatever register it is. So that's timer one counter low and high and registers four and five. And timer one actually has several different modes that it can operate in. And those are set using this auxiliary control register. So there's this bit uh, six and seven here for T1, or timer one uh, timer control that can be put into any of these modes. And this auxiliary control register is register a number B. So I can define that in the code as well. And so those top two bits in the auxiliary control register control what mode the timer's in. And the first one I'll show you is just this first mode where they're both set to zero. And we know we're not doing anything with timer two or any of this other stuff. So we can actually just set this whole register to zero. So right here in our initialization code, we've already got a zero in the A register. So we'll just store that to the auxiliary control register. So that'll set that to zero. And that puts the counter into uh, one shot mode, which is basically a countdown timer. So that means we'll be able to load the timer with some time value and have it count down, and then we can figure out when the timer expires. And this part of the data sheet here on page 17 describes how that works, but it's a little bit confusing because there's four different registers that it uses. There's the timer one latch high and latch low, timer one counter high, and timer one counter low. And basically the way it works is that the low and high in each case here together make up a 16-bit counter. So overall, the timer can be set to any value between one and 65535, which is you know, the, the highest number that can be represented with 16 bits. And if we're reading these registers, the, the latch, so high and low to get this, this, these 16 bits here, this latch, tell us what the counter was set to, in other words, where it started, and then the 16-bit counter tells us where the counter is. So as it starts counting down, this will start counting down. So when the timer starts, this latch and this counter are equal, but then as soon as it starts, the, the counter starts counting down. Uh, but getting it set up initially is a little bit weird. But if we go through here, it, it, it just sort of describes it. So it says uh, so six, bit six and seven of the ACR logic zero. So we set that, so that sets the mode. Then it says the low order timer one counter or low order timer one latch must then be loaded with the count value. So we have some count value that we want to count, some uh, you know period that we want to time. And it says we can set that either in the... Uh, the latch low or the counter low. And it says note that a load to the low order uh, timer one counter is effectively a load to the uh, low order timer one latch. So if we load some value into this counter, it's automatically gonna load that same value into the latch. And then it says next, the high order count value must be loaded into the high order uh, timer one counter, at which time the value is simultaneously loaded into the high order uh, latch. So same thing, we can load a value into the uh, high counter, and then that will load it into the uh, the latch. But loading into the uh, the high counter is special because that actually is what starts the clock. So it says the counter will start counting down on the next uh, phi two clock, so the next uh, processor clock, following the load sequence into high order T one counter. So this high order T one counter, that's kind of your your start your start button. <laughs> so when you load into that, it starts the counting. It also says during the load sequence, the contents of the low order 
T1 latch is transferred to the low order T1 counter. So it actually, when we load this, it does a couple of things. So it copies what you're loading into the, the high order latch, as well as copying the contents of the low order latch back down into the uh, low order counter, as well as actually starting the counter. So anyway, all of that is to say that, that as, as kind of a shortcut, you can almost just ignore this latch altogether and just think, well, first you load the lower, low order counter with the lower eight bits of whatever value you want to count to, and then you load the high order counter. And as soon as you do that, you've got all 16 bits loaded in there and the counter starts right away. And the fact that it's copying that into this latch is kind of beside the point. We don't really care in this case. However, there's, there's another mode that we'll talk about a little bit later where, where that does come into play. But anyway, once it starts counting, it says, you know, they'll start counting down. And once the, uh, the T1 counter reaches a zero count, uh, the interrupt flag is set. So once this gets to zero, it'll, it'll set this interrupt. And the interrupt flag it's talking about is this interrupt flag register here, which is uh, register zero D. And if we look at this interrupt flag register, it's got a bunch of bits for different sorts of interrupts. And bit six is timer one. So when that timer gets to zero, it'll set this bit in the interrupt flag register. So that's another register we'll need to be able to look at. And so that's the interrupt flag register and it'll be address 600D. Now for the delay subroutine, we'll go down here and basically just get rid of all this. And what we're gonna replace it with is initializing that timer value and then waiting for the timer to expire. And the timer is 16 bits. So the maximum we can get is FFFF, which is 65,535. And this is gonna be clock cycles that the timer is gonna run. And so since we've got a one megahertz clock, that means this is gonna be 65,000 uh, microseconds or 65 milliseconds. And so that's the longest we can have the timer run for. If we wanna do a more round number, we could do say 50 uh, milliseconds, which would be that. And that would be in hex be C350. So when we load our timer, that low value, the low uh, byte would be five zero and the high byte would be C3. So we'll load the low one first and then the high one, that'll start the timer. So the low byte is five zero and that goes in the timer one counter low and then the high byte is C3 and that goes in timer one counter high. And as soon as we store that into the timer one counter high, that starts the timer. So now at this point, we basically just need to wait for the timer to expire. So we can just sit in a loop here, uh, checking to see if the timer's expired. And we're gonna know the timer's expired by looking at bit six in the interrupt flag register, this IFR. And to check that bit six, what we can use is we can use the bit instruction. The bit instruction does a few things to do a bit test. It ands the, 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 the operand with the, whatever's in the accumulator. So you can set certain bits in the accumulator to test those bits. Um, and then it'll set the zero flag if, if it matches or not. But it also just uh, copies the bit seven and bit six into the negative flag and the overflow flag. So we're interested in bit six. And so you can see it just copies bit six right into the overflow flag. So if we do a bit test of the interrupt flag register, we can then do a branch if overflow clear back to delay one. What that'll do is it'll say if the overflow flag is clear after doing this uh, bit test on the interrupt flag register, in other words, if bit six is clear, then just jump back up to delay and just sit in this loop. And so essentially we're sitting in this loop, these three lines here until bit six gets flipped in the interrupt flag register. And so bit six being set uh, means that there's a it's set by timeout of timer one, and then we can clear it um, by reading timer one counter low. So once we drop out of this loop here, if we just read from timer one counter low, that'll reset that, that flag to sort of acknowledge that we've, we've detected that the timer has expired. So that's our new delay routine. So this will delay for exactly 50 milliseconds. Let's give it a try. So install the new program here and reset. And there we go, it's blinking. And with a 50 millisecond delay between when it turns on and off, that'll be 100 milliseconds per cycle, or, or in other words, it'll flash about 10 times per second, which is what it appears to be doing. So that seems to work, but you know, it's got some drawbacks as well. At least in theory though, during this loop here, we could uh, do stuff, you know, between each time we check to see if the timer's expired. And it wouldn't really matter how long that stuff took if it was, you know, at least as long as it wasn't more than, you know, tens of milliseconds because the timer is running independently. So, so at least in theory, we have the ability to, to maybe do some other stuff while the timer's running, although the, the program's not really structured all that well for it. But we're also limited here because the, the maximum delay we can do is, is 65,000 uh, cycles, or in our case with our clock, it'd be 65 microseconds. You know, if we wanted a longer delay, we could just call the routine multiple times. 
but there's actually still a better way. And that brings me to the second mode for the timer, which is free run mode, which you set by setting this uh, T1 timer control to 0, 1. And that gives you continuous interrupts. So basically, if we look back at, at this here, we've got our counter and our latches. And before, what would happen is we would load this counter up, and it would count down, and when it got to zero, we would get that interrupt where we get notified. In free run mode, what happens is when this gets to zero, we get notified, but then it immediately restarts by loading whatever's in those latches and resets the timer and starts all over again. And so that's where you see the value of having a separate latch, which indicates what the timer should reset to when it resets. And the data sheet describes, you know, how, how that works exactly. So, you know, it talks about if you reset by loading the counter while it's counting, it'll reset the counter right away. Whereas if you load the latches while it's counting, then you're configuring what it should reset to once the current counter expires. So it gives you a fair amount of flexibility. But I think the most useful way to use it is as an interval timer that just triggers at a predictable interval. So if we look at the code, what I'm gonna do is instead of setting up the timer uh, here when we want to initiate a delay, I'm going to set up the timer at the very beginning of the program. So when the computer first resets, I'm going to have it run a, an initialized timer routine. And then I'll actually get rid of all this delay stuff. And then the init timer routine will be where we first initialize the value that we want for our timer. And then since the timer is going to be running in uh, free run mode, We'll want to set the uh, the first two bits, this timer control of the auxiliary control register, the ACR, we want to set that to 0, 1 so that we get continuous interrupts. So before we were up here um, initializing the ACR uh, register to, to 0. So instead what I'll do is when we initialize the timer, we'll set the ACR to have those first two bits be 0, 1. And that'll put the timer into free run mode. And that'll cause the timer to trigger uh, you know, continuously at, at whatever interval we set here. And then as for that interval, we want it to trigger fairly frequently. So I'm going to set it to 10 milliseconds, which would be 10,000 microseconds. Although actually, uh, you, know, you got to pay attention to your data sheet because you know, what you see here is, is in this uh, free run mode, we're going to get these interrupts, I or QB, that's our interrupt. It's going to happen every N plus two cycles. So if we want these interrupts to come every 10 milliseconds, we actually don't want 10,000 microseconds. We want uh, 9,000 Whoops, we want 9,998. That way, n plus 2 is going to give us a period of, of 10,000. So we convert that to hex, and it's 270e. So the counter low byte we want to set to 0e, and the counter high byte we want to set to 27. So the counter low will be 0e, and the counter high will be 27. So this will cause that timer to trigger interrupts every 10 milliseconds. But then as to how we detect that interrupt, there's actually sort of two ways. So one we saw is this interrupt flags register. We can look at that and see if that bit six is set, and that's what we were doing before. But in order to detect that, we have to pull this interrupt flags register and continuously check to see if that bit's set. We can also have the 6522 actually trigger an interrupt, a processor interrupt, by setting a bit in the interrupt enable register. So there's a corresponding bit in the interrupt enable register for timer one that we can set. And so if we set this interrupt enable register, which is zero E, if we set that register and we have the set bit set and the timer one bit set, that will enable interrupts for timer one. And we'll actually get an IRQ, an interrupt request that will trigger when that timer expires. So the interrupt enable register is another register here and it's at register address E, so 600 E. And so if we set the first two bits of that, so the first bit to say we want to enable interrupts and the second bit to say we want the interrupt for timer one, that'll generate interrupts. And then we need to write some code to handle the interrupts. And so we can put an interrupt handler here. Right now there's no interrupt handle, it's just set to zero. But we could set that to uh, IRQ and define that here. And that'll be our interrupt handler. And at the end of the interrupt handler, we want to return from interrupt. And then the only thing we really have to do in the interrupt handler is clear the interrupt. And you know, for this case, it, we're only expecting interrupts for a timeout of timer one. So we can read this timer one counter low. Um, that's probably the easiest way to clear the interrupt. And we really don't care what the value is. We just need to read it to acknowledge the interrupt. So we can use the bit instruction, which will read it without doing anything with any of the registers, uh, other than the flags register, which will get automatically restored at the end of an interrupt anyway. But the thing I really want to do in this interrupt handler is actually just count the number of interrupts we get. So the basic plan here is just to have some variable, call it ticks. And every time we get an interrupt, so every uh, 10 milliseconds, we'll increment ticks. 
and then anywhere else, and, and ticks is just a variable in memory, and anywhere else in our program we can look at ticks to see, you know, essentially sort of what time it is or how many how many ticks have passed since the computer started up. And so ticks is just going to be some value in memory. So we have to define it up here. And we could just put it at address zero. That's the beginning of memory. So we'll just say zero, 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 zero is, is the address for, for this ticks variable. Um, although if we just say zero, zero, that's a shorthand for saying address zero. It means the same thing. It's address zero in memory. And of course, if we do this, um, what will happen is every time we get an interrupt, so every 10 milliseconds, we'll increment ticks until ticks reaches 255, and then it'll wrap around. But it's actually pretty straightforward to make this a much bigger variable by using uh, four different bytes. So ticks is in you know address zero in memory, but ticks plus one is going to be in address one, address two, and address three. And we could you know sort of piece all four of those bytes together to create a, a single 32-bit number. And with 32 bits, you know, we could store values up to 4.2 billion, which if we're counting you know 10 millisecond intervals, you know, that would let us count up to 42 million seconds, which is you know, almost 500 days. So with a 32-bit tick counter like this, we could keep track of intervals uh, of up to you know almost 500 days, which uh, you know seems like more than enough for a breadboard computer. And the way we do that is after we increment ticks, we see if it rolled over. We see if it if it equals zero. And if it doesn't equal zero, then we exit our interrupt handler because we've successfully incremented it. But if it does equal zero, then that means it rolled over. And so what we'll do is we'll increment ticks plus one. So that means we incremented this, it got to zero, and so then we increment uh, ticks plus one, which is going to increment our next byte in our 32-bit uh, uh, word. And then same deal, if that doesn't roll over, we exit the uh, interrupt handler. But if it did roll over, then we go on and, and increment the next byte. So that means this rolled over, so now we increment this byte. And as long as that didn't roll over, we'll exit the interrupt handler. Otherwise, we'll increment the last byte. So we've initialized our timer uh, and set it to trigger every 10 milliseconds. And then every 10 milliseconds, we're going to come into our IRQ handler here and we'll increment our ticks counter. And it's a 32-bit it's a counter. And you know most of the time when this IRQ is triggered, we'll clear the interrupt, we'll increment ticks, and it's not going to roll over most of the time, so we'll just branch down to end IRQ and, and exit. So it's a very small interrupt handler that's not going to uh, create much of a performance penalty. And I suppose one other thing we can do in our initialize timer here is initialize our ticks counter, uh, all four bytes of it, to, to zero. So that way our counter starts out at zero. And so what this lets us do is when we get up to our, our program here, you know, we can sit in this loop. And while we're sitting in this loop, in the background, that tick counter is just going to keep incrementing every 10 milliseconds. And so if we want to, let's say, toggle the LED on and off every 250 milliseconds, all we need to do is just keep track of what that tick counter is. And if it's increased by 25, then we know that 250 milliseconds has passed, and then we'll toggle the LED. So to do that, I'll create another variable um, which tracks the toggle time. And we can put that in uh, memory page 0 as well. And I'll put it at address 4, because remember, ticks is at address 0, but it's also at address 1, 2, and 3, because it's a 4-byte value. So the next sort of memory address that's free is address four. So we'll put our toggle time there. And I'm just going to keep track of one byte of toggle time, since we're not trying to keep track of intervals that are longer than 256 ticks, which would be, uh, I guess, about two and a half seconds. So one byte's enough. But let's initialize that toggle time to zero here. Uh, we'll just start it out at zero. And then what we want to do in our loop is basically just compare the toggle time to the current time, the current whatever ticks currently is, because that, you know ticks is going to constantly be increasing in the background. So we just want to compare the toggle time to ticks. And actually, what we can do is just subtract them and see what the difference is. And to do subtraction in the 6502, you start out by setting the carry bit, uh, because it uses the carry bit as sort of an inverse of a borrow. So you always start out by setting that. And then we'll uh, load ticks, whatever that happens to be at the moment, and we'll subtract the toggle time from that. And that'll tell us how many ticks have passed since the last time toggle time was set. And then that difference is going to be in the accumulator, so we can just do a compare to compare it to uh, you know whatever value we want. So we can compare it to 25, and that'll see if 250 milliseconds have elapsed. And if 250 milliseconds or more have elapsed, then the carry bit will be set. So if the carry bit is not set, then we can just branch if carry clear back to loop and check again, because ticks is going to be constantly updating. Otherwise, we'll drop down here, and what we want to do is basically just toggle the LED. And in this case, we can't just do the increment decrement because we don't know if the LED is on or off. We, we want to toggle it. So 
what we can do is just XOR the LED bit by one and that'll toggle it. So we'll XOR uh, whatever's on port A with one and that'll flip the bit in that one bit position and then write that back out to port A and that'll toggle the LED. And then one other thing we have to do is we have to keep track of the current toggle time. So we just toggled the LED. So let's load up the low order byte for ticks and store that as our new toggle time. And then we'll go back up to the top of our loop and we'll now be checking ticks against uh, the, the updated toggle time and see if another 250 milliseconds have elapsed and just keep going through that process. So let's save this and give it a try. So there we go, put that in, reset. And of course it's not working. And I think what we're missing is we enable interrupts here on the 6522 to tell it to send interrupts, but we haven't enabled them on the processor. So there's the, there's the clear interrupt inhibit instruction, which enables interrupts. So let's uh, enable that and give that a try. All right, let's try this again. And there we go. So it's blinking and it looks like that's probably toggling every uh, 250 milliseconds. If we want to verify that, we could measure by hooking a oscilloscope up. So let's do that. And so there it is, and it's toggling every 250 milliseconds. So the, uh, the entire cycle is 500 milliseconds or twice per second. And the frequency it's showing us is about two Hertz. So that all checks out. So this obviously has a huge advantage that we can, you know, basically wait for any arbitrary amount of time here. You know, we're literally just looking for 250 milliseconds. And, you know, we could change this to whatever time we wanted. If we wanted a much longer time, you know, we might need to do a 16-bit comparison, but that's certainly doable. And it's also fairly straightforward to have the processor do other stuff uh, at the same time. And just to kind of demonstrate that, what I could do is I could sort of refactor this a little bit, change this uh, to a sort of an update LED subroutine. And the subroutine will do basically the same thing. It's when you call a subroutine, it will check the current time, the current ticks counter, and, and versus the last time the LED was toggled and see if it's been at least 250 milliseconds, then toggle the LED again and record the new toggle time and then return from the subroutine. And then that way, the way we could write our program is we could have just a main loop for our program like this. And then in that loop, we just call this update LED routine. And of course we could do all sorts of other stuff in this main loop as well. As long as we call that update LED subroutine every so often and everything will be fine. And of course our ticks counter is, is ticking away in the background and other uh, subroutines could use that for other things and, and so on. So you can see this technique provides quite a bit of flexibility. So now that we've got our LED flashing at whatever rate we would like it to flash at, we could, you know, do some other things with the computer and, you know, perhaps have something uh, that we put out on the display that updates uh, periodically uh, in addition to the LED. So just as kind of a demonstration of that, I've pulled in some of the LCD routines that I've written in previous videos uh, that you can go back and look at. Uh, and I've got a, a new function here called update LCD. And it's basically doing the same thing that we just saw with the update LED, which is it's looking at the, the ticks, the, the global ticks counter, um, and comparing it to this uh, LCD time variable, which is just a new variable I have that's keeping track of the last time the LCD was updated. And it's comparing it to 100 uh, in decimal. So that's going to be one second. So it's going to update the LCD every second. So if, if it hasn't reached one second, then it skips LCD. Um, that jumps down here and returns from the subroutine. But otherwise, we, we do all this stuff. And basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the ticks value and ticks plus one, so the, the lower 16 bits of ticks, and putting that into this value, which is used by printNum. And again, you can check out a um, previous video on printing a 16-bit decimal number to the LCD. Um, but that's basically what we're doing is we're printing the ticks value, whatever it happens to be, or at least the lower 16 bits of it, we're printing that out to the LCD. And so we store that, so that's the first thing we do is we store the current ticks value. And then we clear the display and we print that number. Um, and then here we're loading ticks and storing that as LCD time. So that's just recording the last time that we updated the LCD. And that's what we're using up here for comparison as well. So this should look very familiar to the update LED routine that we just wrote. It's just that instead of these three lines where we toggle the LED, we've got these lines here where we print out the current ticks value, whatever that happens to be. And if we go up to our main loop, it's pretty simple. We just sit in a loop and update the LED, update the LCD, 
update the LED, update the LCD. And then each of these routines is sort of responsible for figuring out if it's time to update. So update LED is gonna update every 250 milliseconds. It'll talk to the LED and the LCD will update every one second. And actually there's a change I need to make here when we're reading the value of ticks and ticks plus one. It's possible for an interrupt to occur that changes ticks in the middle of this. So I need to set interrupt inhibit here and then clear interrupt inhibit uh, down here. That way no interrupts can occur that change ticks while we're reading the two bytes of ticks here. And if we want to take a look at what that looks like, I've got that program in here. So we'll go ahead and reset. And the LED is flashing. And here you see the uh, LCD updating. And it's updating every second, and it's printing out the current ticks value, which is you know incrementing every 10 milliseconds, so 100 times a second. And since it's printing the current ticks value right after it rolls past each 100 ticks, uh, we see it uh, appearing to just count by hundreds. So anyway, hopefully you found that interesting to see how programmable timers are used by a computer and some of the different things that they make possible. So as always, you know, thanks to all my patrons for helping make this video possible and, and all the videos on my channel possible. And remember, if you're interested in trying any of this stuff yourself, check out my website, eater.net 6502. You can find all the details on how the 6502 computer works and, and build your own.